Well, happy Mother's Day to everyone who's here, and also we reserve a happy Mother's Day for those that will soon be coming, and those online, happy Mother's Day to you. Uh, just a little something about Mother's Day here at the beginning. You know, all these holidays, they come up, they're already talking about, I, the only reason I thought about Memorial Day is because they talked about Memorial Day sales that are happening, they're starting already. <laughs> Can you believe that? But some countries have a multi-century history of a day to celebrate mothers. The modern American version of the holiday began in the United States in the early 20th century at the initiative of Anna Jarvis, who organized the first Mother's Day service of worship and celebration at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia, which serves today as the international uh, shrine of Mother's Day. International Mother's Day Shrine, that's, that's there. It's not directly related to many traditional celebrations because that's existed over thousands of years. The Greeks did it, the Romans did it, early Christian uh, Mothering Sunday and things like that. And uh, some of the countries use some of these older times of celebration. Uh, <laughs> what about this? We'll take a vote. The American version of Mother's Day has been criticized for having become too commercialized. You ever you think it might be? You ever look at the cards and all that? You, you know what I said? Commercialized, you know? <laughs> Jarvis herself will begin the celebration as a liturgical, that means kind of like religious observance, regretted this commercialism. And she said this wasn't her intention. But uh, at any rate, you know, it's like many things. Celebrated different ways, many different things for many different people. But uh, we're just glad, you know, they can... Uh, Norm and I were having a very intelligent conversation. Some people are, are, are making a problem with the word mother now, you know, and mom and all that. Well, I'll tell you something. And everybody can just get this and put it down in their book, okay? Nobody got here without one. And it was a mother. It was a woman, a female. And I'm not interested in, 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 in I'll talk about labs and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, people are going to be sorry, sorry, sorry someday. I was thinking about just a while back we read where, and we'll and we'll mention it again today as we talk about the prophets. It wasn't that Jeremiah, uh, when 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 God spoke to him, God didn't just say, "Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you." He said, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you." Can you believe that? See, so it's in the hands of God. Let's do what the Word of God says. It's all about the Word of God. Would you stand with me for a moment? Let's ask the Lord to help us today and to be with us and to bless us and to anoint us. I'm going to preach some more, even though it's Mother's Day, we're going to preach about the prophets still and how that they were sent to speak and sent to preach and sent to put out the Word of God and to make it real to people. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you right now. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this Mother's Day. We th thank you for this chance to be together. We thank you for this opportunity, not only to celebrate Mother's Day, but to have another Sunday, a time together in the Lord, a time together with the blessing of God, with the anointing of God, a time to realize that uh, on Father's Day and Mother's Day and all these days where we remember important people, you are the greatest one connected with us. You're the most important one connected with us. And you've reached out and you've touched us and you've blessed us and you've anointed us. And you've given us something real. We pray for all of the people in our church and congregation who have special needs and afflictions. Some who are here, some who are not here, Lord. And people who are part of our families and part of our life, part of our anointing, part of the opportunity to be together. Our family isn't what you can see on any given day or at any given time. It's the family of God. It's the family of God. Some singers sang about that many years ago. I'm so glad that I'm part of the family of God. Lord, help us to realize today what it means to be part of the family of God, to be in the presence of God, to be in the service of God, to be in the anointing of God. Thank you for that. Anoint us. Touch us with everything that you have. And uh, make it real. Is there, is, there, is there someone on your heart today that needs a special touch? Just raise up your hand right now. Maybe a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, aunts, uncles, all kinds of people. We looked at a lot of pictures this week that I got from some parts of the family. Lots of people in our family went back to when I was just a child and even before that. And a, lot, a lot of these people that we saw in those pictures have gone to be with the Lord. But we pray for families that they'll continue on until Jesus comes. 
That's all the world has is the preaching of the gospel. Amen? That's all the world's got. doesn't have anything else. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, let me, let me say something about Mother's Day. Uh, as you can see, we got something kind of special being done for you right now. Uh, my mother wanted to do this in honor uh, of, her, of my father that's going to be with the Lord. You, you all remember him. And, and my brother's part of this, but I, I mm -hmm. think she's got a rose. Uh, you know, and, and you know what? It won't, it, it won't take you long to realize that it's artificial, but it looks real. But the love that it represents is real. Amen? She did this in honor. My father, it's, it's, and all of the people here that she loves that have been so good, not only to her, but you've been good to her son. I've been here for over 50 years. You've been good to me. <laughs> and I was just thinking... Somebody might ask, is, did anybody, is anybody in the church now a child when you got here? But listen, some of them were not only children, they weren't even born yet. You know, we, we're, we're ministering, we had a chance through the years to minister to grandchildren of people that were here. That's what happens when you hang around more than a half a century. And listen, Joe's been here longer than I have, you know. <laughs> How long have you been around now? No, 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 no ages. My, my mother would probably, you know they used to do that kind of silly stuff, the youngest mother, the oldest mother, and all that kind of stuff. My mother would probably win on the oldest person, but we don't want to say that out loud. But, uh, but she's doing pretty good, and she wanted to have those. So how many, how many of our mothers, just raise your hand, or maybe hold your flower up if you got it. Amen. Praise the Lord. There'll be another one coming in the door pretty soon. See, Joe, my mom's getting everybody a rose today. I'm not everybody, but all the mothers. Amen. Well, listen. We're going to be here until the Lord calls us home or until he comes back for us. So I'll sing that little chorus that says, Oh, I want to see him, Gee. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. That's what our desire is today. Amen? Oh, I want to see Oh, 
Jeremiah, gird up your loins and arise and speak all that I commanded thee. And don't be afraid and dismayed at the looks on the faces of the people that are coming against you. Because God says, I'm going to confound them before you. I'm going to confound them before you. They're not going to, they're not going to win. They are not going to win. The enemy is not going to win. God's people are going to win. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, well, God bless you. Once again, happy Mother's Day. And we see this oh boy, look at all these roses. <laughs> nice, huh? Nice. It's a little extra special. Amen. Let's, and speaking of extra special, let's, let's take up an extra special offering. Good tithes and offerings. Let's have our ushers come receive our offering this morning. We have people that are never able to be with us. There are other places that listen online and keep up with us. And, and, and there are many folks that remember us with their offerings and and, uh, and their giving. They might have uh, their own church that they take care of and do the right thing, but they remember us too. And that's a wonderful thing. God God has resources a lot better than we think he does. So you guys can come on down and, and uh, we'll have Terry pray that this will be an extra special offering because it's... Not, not by the size, but by the fact that God's going to make it extra special. Jesus fed 5,000 with just a handful. You kind of know what that's like, right? You, you've all been through that time where you said this. What are these among so many? Jesus said, let me have it. Let me have it. Just think about all the times God took a little bit and made it a lot. And the apostles were worried about it. Remember? Do you think it was just an accident that there were 12 big helpings left over? You think that was just an accident? I don't think so. Terry, go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're truly thankful for this time that we can spend in your house today again, Lord. And Lord, for as we celebrate today, uh, Mother's Day, Lord, we just want to just ask you to put a, a blessing upon every single person here, Lord, especially the mothers, the ones that have taken care of us and raised us and brought us up to, to know your name and your son, Jesus. Lord, we just ask you to keep each person here in your care as we go through this week. And just like you fed all these people with just the little boy's lunch, Lord. We just ask you to just take our blessings and just pour them out, giving just a simple cup of cold water to someone in need, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to keep each person here in your care as we go through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
assurance. Amen. We mentioned uh, earlier in the service, maybe some of you weren't with us, but about uh, the <clears throat> country singer Mickey Gilly uh, passing away just, I guess, yesterday. And his cousins were, of course, two uh, well-known people. One was Jerry Lee Lewis, and then the other was the preacher, Jimmy Swagger. And, and, and I, was, I was looking at my mother back there, uh, giving out those roses, and I don't know if she remembers this particular uh, situation or not, but when I was very young, and, you know, may, may, maybe junior high school, but uh, nobody knew who Jimmy Swagger was then. He was traveling just as an evangelist, and so his son was just, uh, just old enough to be able to put Pete. My dad was rebuilding the front of the church, and, he, and, and his son, don't anybody remind him of this, he's a grown man with children now, but his son was putting pieces of the rock lath in our pastor's upright base. <laughs> and Brother Raymond didn't know that they lifted it up and he could hear it. He was just a little kid. But anyway, he started a revival on a Sunday night. And I guess the word got around that somebody was doing some pretty good music. And, and, and Monday night, you couldn't get a seat in our church. And we had to, we had to go to tennis, but you, you could get a seat. But not Monday night, you couldn't. But I, I was just thinking about... Uh, one, and he was getting good results and response and people liked the music but one, one night during that week uh, Brother Swagger was singing a song and I guess this might just been part of the deal but it, maybe it wasn't going across kind of like the way he wanted so it came to a part where he was just playing and not singing and he looked at the people in the church and he said I like this song and I'm going to sing it until you like it <laughs> I said well I, well I want you to know this and if you want to get out of here on time you better, you better do this I like this sermon. I'm going to preach it until you like it. But I think you do. Amen. I think you do. And uh, we just live from week to week and trust the Lord to have more time. But each, each Sunday as the Lord leads, we put what we can into it. As you know, we were talking about the power and the effect and the importance of the Word of God. And then we have emphasized almost every time we've come at it. Uh, how that it ties in, of course, with the Old Testament prophets, and we're, we're just looking at them in a special kind of way, dealing with the Word. And uh, we're going to come back to some of them again. I'll, I'll try to explain what we're doing, but I'm kind of, I'm not making it up as I go, but the Lord just kind of leading me as I go, and showing me, I really believe He does, showing me what He wants me to do. But to get into the New Testament, understanding of the Word, and it's so much more than just the, the Word. Now, I know Ezekiel said, the word of the Lord came unto me over and over and over. It, it, he didn't say it came to him over and over and over. It did. But he said it over and over and over in the book. And the word of the Lord came to me. And the Lord, word of the Lord came unto me. And the word of the Lord came unto me. And uh, we've emphasized the word. But like John said, in the beginning was the word. It's not, it's not just God speaking. But the word was God. And not only that, the word became flesh. That's the incarnation of Jesus that John was talking about. He saw it and dwelt among us. The only begotten of God. Very difficult time at Jesus' birth. And the time that Jesus came was a bad time. And we've emphasized that the prophets had their greatest ministry in the bad times. That's when you need the greatest word, the greatest response. And I said to somebody, it's not so much that the light's greater, the light is just fine. God's light is just fine. But as it gets darker, as it gets darker, the light seems to be brighter, right? You know why? You know why? Because it's darker. So whenever it gets dark, just enjoy the good, shining, bright light of the Lord. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. They saw Him, and we still do today. Amen. Now, we emphasize, we're going to introduce the ones that are called the four major prophets, not because they were more important than the minor prophets, but because of the length of the book. Bible scholars, teachers have just called the Major prophets, the ones with the longest uh, narrative, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then the others are called minor prophets. And we're going to look at these different ones. We've already talked about Jeremiah. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, he said, The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. 
You got no business preaching unless the Lord has put his words in your mouth. The prophet does not speak of himself. He speaks that which he hears. He doesn't make up some story. It's what God gives him. We talked about the commission of Isaiah in chapter 6. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, an angelic type creature of worship, not the same as an angel, but an angelic type creature, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, This has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord. Did you get that? I, I heard the voice of the Lord. And even then, the main purpose of being here was what I said, evangelism. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And God, and God heard Isaiah say, here am I, send me. And in Isaiah uh, chapter 1, at the end of, of uh, verse 2, or the beginning of verse 2, excuse me, the beginning, chapter 1, Isaiah, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Why, why should the world listen to us? Some people's uh, presentation seems to be in some ways more effective than others, depending on the kinds of people and what they like. And we have a tendency to judge people like that, and that, that goes over to services and preachers and things like that. And, and, it, and it probably shouldn't be that way. But I don't care how good you are and how you sound, and I don't, I don't care how, how, how like, like an evangelist playing the piano and singing or someone preaching. And, and, and by the way, somebody put on Facebook that they were looking at an old directory. You, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this, Janet. They were looking at an old directory of Assembly of God Evangelists many, many years ago, and they said 19 of them were, were in the picture with their wife and an accordion. <laughs> well, I, I, I had an accordion. Uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, they, they were useful. But, uh, you know, that, that's good. And, and, we, and we've got it, folks. Full gospel, Pentecostal, evangelical. we got the music department sold up. It doesn't get any better. But if you're not preaching the word... If you're not singing the word, see, we, we do all this, but we believe what we're doing. When Joe plays an offering, and, and, and maybe there's not a word, but we know what it is, like Blessed Assurance. That would be a great song with them playing that, but how good would it be for us spiritually if it wasn't the truth? Blessed Assurance. So, like Isaiah said, the reason why you should listen is because the Lord has spoken. And then, and then we, we talked about Ezekiel on that magnificent vision. It was one of the most elaborate manifestations and visions of God that anybody ever had in the Old Testament. And maybe the New Testament almost. I mean, you, you, you can read that. All of these things that have been tried to, they tried to turn them into things, but they're, they're, they're spiritual representations of God. And in the first chapter, though, it doesn't matter. You know, we talk about the living creatures and the four wheels inside of wheels and the rings and all of that. And all, you can read about the vision. But the point is... As simple as in chapter 1, verse 1, the second part, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Not visions of man. Some, some weird folks, you know, strange people that tried to say that what Ezekiel saw were visitors from, from another planet, you know, like UFOs. But come on, folks. It, it, it was a visitation, all right, but it wasn't, un, it wasn't unidentified. As I already said, Ezekiel said, the word of the Lord. That was the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord mani manifested itself to me. And he went out. And listen, Jesus came at one of the worst times. All of these prophets were in difficult times. Captivity was coming. Captivity was at, at hand. Captivity was ending and you needed guidance and restoration to come home properly. To get ready for the next time, God's going to have to send you away. When Jesus was born in the city of David, Bethlehem in Judea, and, and the wise men, the Magi came to Jerusalem, they were only 70 years from being destroyed. Jerusalem, 
and Judea was being destroyed in just 70 years. So take out Jesus 33 years on this earth. And then the same time again and it's goodbye. And what if the apostles had nothing but Jerusalem? What if they had nothing but Bethlehem? What if they had nothing but Judah and Israel? What about all the people that were scattered all over the world? God's people were scattered. What if they didn't have anything but memories? But they, what did they have? The word of the Lord. They might not have always followed it. They might not have always listened to it. But one thing the Jews started doing when they were scattered abroad after that Roman dispersion is they started not building temples, but they built synagogues. And they went in there and they heard people read the word. Maybe it became formalized or ceremonial sometimes, but it was the word of God. Jesus went into the synagogue when he came and walked in. Not only read the word, but commented on the word. Said he was the fulfillment of that word. So Jeremiah touched by God. Isaiah touched by God. Ezekiel touched by God. Jeremiah said, said uh, the, ba the Babylonian captivity is right at the doorstep. He saw it take place. Isaiah had said it was coming. Jeremiah said it's here. And Ezekiel was in it. The only reason Jeremiah wasn't taken was because he was too old. He went with some others. It was treated kind of special by the enemy, by the way. We won't get into that today, but he had more respect given him by the enemy than he received from these people that were supposed to be believers. It's not what you say, it's what you believe and what you do. It's what's in your heart. God can open the door. God can shut the door. So there's Ezekiel down with the common people by the river Chebar, seeing revelations of God. So the only other minor, uh, major, excuse me, I want to make sure I get these right. Now, if I get it wrong, just go by what I'm, I'm thinking, not what I'm saying. One other major prophet was Daniel, and it's an entirely different kind of book. And I think we're going to have to come back to the book of Daniel again in the near future, because as we're preaching the prophets here, uh, and we're going to use more than just Daniel, I feel a very strong leading of God to get into some areas of Bible prophecy, because so much is being put out that's wrong and incorrect. Now, there was a group of Christians, a, an organization, uh, that one of their uh, bylines or models was, one, and, and I'm not so sure they always followed this, but, but they said, when the Bible speaks, we speak, and when the Bible's silent, we're silent. Like I, like I say, I'm not sure they always did that, but that's not a bad thing to be like that. If the Bible doesn't say it, don't say it. If the Bible says it, say it. Don't, don't try to figure it out and add to it and multiply it. Don't, don't put a lot of footnotes in the Bible text. That's not, that doesn't mean you can't do that. Like, you know, you see what this word means. Maybe a comment or something. Don't misunderstand me. Write it down, you know. But, but, but people put footnotes. This is what God should have said or what God probably really meant. Be careful with that. Just be careful. Explaining it and helping people to understand and, 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 and saying, that the, do you understand what you're reading? Like, like a... Philip did to the Ethiopian eunuch. That's okay. But be careful. But Daniel was in a special group that was taken into the area of Babylon where the king was and in the palace. It said that they would, they were, they would take, this is in chapter 1, along around verse 3, they would take certain of the children of Israel of the king's seed and of the princes, children that were well favored, young people that were well favored, it didn't, didn't mean children, but young, young men, skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability to stand in the king's palace, to whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. <laughs> I always, I always thought that was funny. If you don't mind my laugh, you might say, I'm not sure what's funny about that. Yeah, we're going we're, we're gonna to bring these guys in here. And there was especially four of them that are going to be mentioned because they're so important. And, we're gonna, and, and they're, they're, they've shown that they're talented. And, and we're going to teach them to think like Chaldeans. How, how much money you want to put on that, Nebuchadnezzar? How much you want to lay on the table, Nebuchadnezzar, that they're going to learn anything from you? Now, that didn't mean that the Babylonians, uh, in their knowledge and in their investigations and in their interest in things, uh, didn't, didn't know some things that maybe still some of these Hebrew young people didn't know. But they were, they were going to learn some things they didn't know. They're going to learn some things they didn't know. Here's what it said. 
the king appointed them a daily provision. And uh, they took care of them for three years and, and see who, who all was there and how things were going. And it said among these people, these young people, these youth of Judah, were, were somebody named Daniel, Hananiah, this is verse 6, Mishael, and Azariah. So they were given Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, and hardly ever is he referred to by that name. He's referred to with his Hebrew name, Daniel. And the other Hebrew partners of his are hardly ever referred to by their Hebrew names, but are known by the ones that were given to them by the Babylonians. Hananiah, uh, he gave the name Shadrach. To Mishael, he gave the name Meshach. And to Azariah, he, named, he gave the name Abednego. And Daniel had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat uh, and uh, associated with anything that seemed to be of idolatry. And they were a little bit concerned about that because they thought that, that he might make himself sick. And the people that were responsible for these young men didn't want to get in trouble with the king. And uh, Daniel said, don't worry about it. Give, it. give it a test and see how things go and, and check it out and, and just see how, how we're getting along and how God does everything. Now, they said, bring them in to the Chaldean culture, Babylonian culture. And we're going to teach them the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Okay. They learned to speak what the Chaldeans were speaking. Read and write and all of that. Cuneiform, remember the stone, the clay tablets that they would press into the wet tablets and then bake them in the ovens? They, they discovered those by the thousands in the Middle East. The area of Iraq, near where Babylon was. So that so it was okay. Daniel, Daniel learned a language that he didn't know and a new, a new experience, but listen, listen to what it's all about. See, let me, let, me, let me tell you not to get too worried about the world. The world thinks it knows what it's doing, but it doesn't really know what the real issue is. You might end up someplace you don't want to be and get into a situation you don't like, but you see, it's not just the world taking you. It's God putting you sometimes in a place. God putting you in a place. And he's going to have you do something for them. They think they're going to do something for you and use your talent and your ability, but you're going to do something for them. Look at what it said here. This is one of the most remarkable verses of Scripture in the book of Daniel. And it's still in the first chapter, verse 17. As for these four young people, that's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge. Not the Babylonians. God gave them skill in all learning. God gave them wisdom. And on top of that, when God would choose to speak in the supernatural by visions and dreams, Daniel had understanding in these things because he was a spiritual man. I don't know that Daniel walked around in his early days saying, I'm a prophet and I'm going to be like Isaiah or like Jeremiah, but he said, I'm, I'm a child of God. And whatever God has for me, that's what I want. I will purpose in my heart that I will please the Lord. I will trust the Lord to take care of me. How would you like it to be taken to a strange land, to a strange place, a strange language? Your home's gone. Your family's gone. You had a few friends that were around you. That made it, that made it a little bit better. But what are you going to do there? You're going to say, God, take care of me. God, minister to me. And you're going to let God use you. How, how does God give them knowledge? How does God give them skill? How does God give them wisdom? It's, it's spiritual. We understand it so much better in the light of the New Testament because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was, was still working. At the end of the time, all of these young men that were there for this time of training, they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with him and communed with them. And he didn't find anybody who could match up to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in all matters of wisdom, wisdom and understanding that he would ever ask them or question them, he found them ten times better than all of the so-called wise men that were in his realm. Ten times better. In every area. 
God not only gave them spiritual knowledge, a spiritual understanding, but God taught them the things that they should know as counselors to the king and his wise men. And Daniel lasted until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus was the person king that overthrew the Babylonian Empire and took over the Babylonian Empire. Became the largest empire that the world had ever seen. And he was the one that was led of God and mentioned a hundred years before he was born that he was going to let Israel go back home at the end of the 70 years. And I've always believed that, that, that probably Daniel or somebody like him said, let, let me show you what, what our prophet said about you before not only you were born, but before your mother was born. Before you ever celebrated Mother's Day. Let me show you what God said. I'm going to raise up my servant, King Cyrus. The priest studied the Wednesday night Bible study for four or five weeks about that. Nebuchadnezzar was a slow learner. Daniel was a fast learner. Nebuchadnezzar was a slow learner. As much as he saw the power and had demonstration of the power that these men had. And he saw how God would protect them and take care of them. He was slow to come around and realize that God did not want him to be a pompous and arrogant and to follow a false way. And looks like he ended up on the right side. He lost his mind for seven years. But he got his right mind back. And it said he bowed down and acknowledged and worshipped and celebrated the God of Daniel. He, he didn't always follow it in the beginning, but he did later. But what he had said was, your God is a God of gods. Well, that's not quite right. Your God is a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. He's not a God of gods. He's God. There is no gods with, a, with, a, with an S on it. He's not, he's not the main God, the chief God. Oh, boy, I, got, I, mean, I, got a, I was never connected trying to wake, wake people up. God wasn't in favor of that kind of thing. God wasn't in favor of saying, I'm the best. you got to say, I'm the only. Did you get what I said? I'm not the best, I'm the only. There are, you should have no other gods before me. He didn't mean before you have your gods, you put me first. He mean no, no other gods. No other gods. Of a truth. And it took him a while to learn. You know about the the image, and you know about the, 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 the burning bush and all of those things. But listen, I just want to I just want to take a few verses before we, we close this down, and, and, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but I want you, I, I just want to mention one of the minor prophets, and we're going to show you some about them, and especially when we get to the book of Joel. But I want you to look at me for just a few verses. I, want, I wanted to get these in, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll let the Lord go with us. Because we've got, if Jesus tarries, we've got time. If he doesn't, well, this will get you to heaven. This will get you to heaven. All of this will. Amen? Amen. Hosea, great prophet. In chapter 1, verse 1, he said, the word of the Lord came to Hosea. There it is. What, what's the calling of the prophet? The word of the Lord's got to come to you. In verse 2, it says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, you don't preach unless God talks to you. And God is talking to you. God is, is not one of the nations that perish, but the law should come to repentance. The Holy Spirit represents God. The Holy Spirit is traveling and looking and calling and representing God. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. See? You don't have truth. You don't have mercy. You don't have knowledge of God. That's because you haven't been hearing the word of the Lord. So God says in these prophets, just like the so-called major prophets, hear the word of the Lord. And in, in verse 6 of that chapter, what's the problem? The same thing as it always was. It's what was wrong in Babylon, it's what was wrong in Persia, it's what was wrong in Israel, and it's wrong today. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. You can't forget me. You have to come to me. And then finally, if you go to chapter 6, what does it say in verse 1 of chapter 6? Come and let us return unto the Lord. Return unto the word of the Lord. God says in verse 6, I desire mercy. Not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. What did it say? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Belteshazzar. Daniel. God. God, the Almighty, only God, gave them knowledge. God will give you knowledge. 
Daniel had understanding. God will give you understanding. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be skilled in everything, but you need the knowledge that God gives. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The spirit of truth. When we talk about Joel, perhaps as early as next week, he prophesied the Holy Spirit will come. I'll pour out my spirit. What spirit? Jesus said it was the spirit of truth. And he's here. And he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you. you, you, you please stand with us. Read over these prophets, uh, you know, look them around a little bit. See what it says about the Word of God. We're, we're saving some of the things in Daniel as the Lord leads us to preach a little bit about some problems that people are having in Bible prophecy. We want to get it right. We, we don't want to plan things that God hasn't planned. And we don't want to put God on our time schedule. God is on His schedule. His schedule. A, lot, a lot of things are happening. A lot of people say, like, like Peter did, where's the Lord? Why hasn't He come? But, but God, God said... I, I, I'm not forgetting my promise, but uh, if, if the Lord seems to be uh, taking his time, it's because he, he, he wants people to be saved. He wants people to be saved. It's not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's sing that chorus. He's coming soon. Jesus. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Right now, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.